Cigarettes were once known as the epitome of cool, prominently displayed in Hollywood films and in slick advertisements in glossy magazines. But decades of evidence that smoking kills has caused consumption to plummet. The industry sold 9 billion packs of cigarettes in the U.S. in 2021, down from more than 21 billion packs in 2000. The number of smokers has dwindled as well. Almost 57% of American men smoked cigarettes in 1955. Today, just 11.5% of U.S. adults, or about 28 million Americans, are smokers. That has caused an existential crisis for tobacco companies. Altria, the parent company of Philip Morris USA and the nation's largest tobacco company with a domestic market share of about 50%, reported a 10% drop in cigarette sales in 2022 from the year prior. The maker of Marlboros says it wants to help smokers transition away from cigarettes to what it calls reduced harm alternatives like e-cigarettes, heat not burn products, chewing tobacco, and nicotine pouches. You know, I have to say there was a fairly stable decline rate in the cigarette category until the last year or two. And I really do believe that what is contributing to a faster decline rate in the cigarette category is these non-combustible alternatives that are available. There wasn't a lot of innovation in the sector for decades. But now you're seeing consumers have more choices and people use different products at different points in the day. So for example, if you can't smoke a cigarette because you are at work or on an airplane, you might use a nicotine pouch to get your nicotine fixed. But Altria's Moving Beyond Smoking campaign has raised eyebrows among its critics, who claim the company is still firmly hooked on cigarettes. In 2022, cigarettes and cigars made up 89% of the company's sales. I'm skeptical that the claims that the companies want to move into e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products are a sincere commitment to harm reduction and improving public health. I think the companies are moving into these products to preserve their profitability and their bottom line. Altria and Philip Morris would like to expand the marketplace. Cigarettes in our nation are slowly declining, no matter what Philip Morris can do. So they're introducing new products, much as they did with low tar cigarettes decades ago. And while Altria has acknowledged that cigarettes are dangerous, it has pushed back against attempts by U.S. health officials to ban menthol-flavored cigarettes and limit nicotine levels that would make them less addictive. Cigarette smoking is a leading cause of preventable death in the U.S., accounting for more than 480,000 deaths annually. But are e-cigarettes and heat not burn products really less harmful than traditional cigarettes? And what impact will those devices have on kids? Philip Morris, a cigar importer, started the company bearing his name in a tobacco shop in London in 1847. Morris developed his first cigarette in 1854, and the business was incorporated in New York in 1902. Cigarette smoking was relatively rare at the time, but improvements in production and the introduction of blends changed that. Per capita cigarette consumption increased from 54 cigarettes annually in 1900 to more than 4,300 cigarettes in 1963. The 40s and 50s saw advertising flourish, with tobacco companies hiring doctors and celebrities to promote their products. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. The history of tobacco marketing is really one about appealing to young people and putting together American values with a deadly product. Bond. James Bond. But it was the ultra-masculine cowboy with a 10-gallon hat that may have had the biggest impact on sales. Though the brand was originally aimed at female smokers, 1955 saw the debut of the Marlboro Man ad campaign starring lifeguards, sailors, and construction workers. Marlboro Country ads appeared in 1963 and leaned into the brand's cowboy persona. By the 1980s, Marlboro was the best-selling cigarette in the U.S. and around the globe. Other leading global tobacco companies today include Philip Morris International, British American Tobacco, Japan Tobacco, and Imperial Brands. But red flags started to appear. Cigarette smoking was first linked to lung cancer in the 1940s and 50s. Around the same time, to reassure smokers that they are being proactive about their health, tobacco companies introduced filters. Every five to 10 years, the tobacco companies claim they're reinventing themselves. It happens just as cigarette sales are beginning to drop and prior marketing campaigns are no longer working as well. So in the 60s, it was the introduction of filters. 
Then it was introduction of low tar cigarettes. In the 80s, it was technological innovations. A report from the U.S. Surgeon General's office in 1964 concluded the average smoker had a 9 to 10 fold risk of developing lung cancer compared to non smokers. For heavy smokers, the risk was 20 fold. Growing pressure spurred Altria to diversify its revenue stream. In 1970, the company purchased Miller Brewing Company. The following year, cigarette advertising was banned on TVs and billboards. In 1988, it acquired Kraft. Two years later, smoking was banned on commercial U.S. flights. Tobacco company leaders, including Philip Morris USA CEO William Campbell, testified to Congress in 1994 that nicotine was not addictive. Cigarettes contain nicotine because it occurs naturally in tobacco. Nicotine contributes to the taste of cigarettes and the pleasures of smoking. The presence of nicotine, however, does not make cigarettes a drug or smoking addiction. Four years later, to help recover health care costs associated with smoking-related illnesses, the largest tobacco companies agreed to settle lawsuits totaling more than $200 billion. Following the decision, in 2003, Philip Morris changed its name to the Altria Group and spun off its overseas business, creating Philip Morris International in 2008. The move cleared PMI from legal and regulatory issues in the U.S. and allowed Altria to focus on its domestic market. I think that there were multiple reasons why they decided to separate the companies. The international business was viewed as having much stronger growth prospects because of higher smoking rates internationally, fewer regulatory headwinds. And that was one of the biggest concerns also in the U.S. is the level of regulatory risk stemming from the FDA and taxes. Altria announced plans to spin off Kraft Foods in 2007, allowing the two companies to focus on their respective businesses. Miller is now owned by Molson Coors, and Altria retains a roughly 10% stake in Anheuser-Busch InBev, the world's largest brewer. In an email to CNBC, the company said, as the industry leader, our goal is to seize the opportunity of harm reduction and fundamentally change the landscape in a way that benefits our adult consumers, our company, its shareholders, and the thousands of people we employ. While Chinese pharmacist Han Leek is often cited as the inventor of the modern e-cigarette, Altria has been trying to develop smoke-free devices for years. Altria invested $12.8 billion for a 35% stake in Juul in 2018. Juul at the time had a more than 70% share of the e-cigarette market. I think that Juul uh, is well positioned to be highly successful in the future. Uh, and I think that uh, over the last year, they've had a number of successes. But that success was fleeting. With teen e-cigarette use surging, Juul faced a series of lawsuits and regulatory battles for allegedly targeting minors. Juul was forced to pay $462 million to settle those claims. The company narrowly avoided bankruptcy, and Altria exited its stake. CEO Howard Willard stepped down as head of Altria in 2020, and the company purchased e-cigarette startup Enjoy for almost $2.8 billion. About $7 billion in e-vapor products were sold in the U.S. in 2022. At the time, more than 11 million people smoked e-cigarettes. Enjoy has about 3% share of the e-vapor category, and Altria sees a path where they can accelerate market share through leveraging their sales and distribution footprint. Juul revolutionized the market. It demonstrated that you could sell these products to young people in very large numbers, that you could addict them, and that the government wasn't keeping pace. We now today have in the United States a host of products that use the technology or similar technology to what Juul used. And as a result, we see a rapid growth in those products. Altria has also tried to make inroads in the heated tobacco market. Those products are similar to cigarettes where they heat tobacco, but not to the point where the leaf catches on fire. In 2019, Altria launched Icos domestically. The device which has the lion's share of the global heated tobacco market was originally developed along with Philip Morris International when the two were combined. The device was banned in the U.S. pending the result of a patent case by R.J. Reynolds. Altria sold its U.S. ICOS rights to PMI for $2.7 billion and now has a partnership with Japan Tobacco to develop new products. 
Altria needs to maximize profitability on their cigarette segment or their smokable segment for the near, if not medium term, because the time it takes to complete an application for the FDA is years in the making and the FDA approval process can take years also. They have multiple initiatives to gain share of the smoke-free market. They acquired a company called On a few years ago. On is a nicotine pouch product, and uh, the category is growing very quickly. Altria is also working on developing products internally. They're developing a product called Swick, which is their own version of a heated tobacco alternative. In addition to its core business led by Marlboro, which commands 42% of the U.S. cigarette market, Altria also sells cigars under its black and mild label in smokeless tobacco brands like Copenhagen and Skoll. Altria had net revenue of $25 billion in 2022, down slightly from 2019. Smokable products made up 89% of revenue, while oral tobacco products made up most of the remainder. Cigarette and tobacco manufacturing is a roughly $52 billion business in the U.S. While smoking rates remain high in many countries like the ones right here, in other markets, the number of users has plummeted. Swedish smoking rates dropped from 15% to less than 6% over the past decade and a half, due in part to the introduction of alternative smoke-free products. New Zealand hopes to phase out smoking entirely, banning tobacco sales to anyone born after 2008. U.S. officials have taken steps to bring smoking levels down domestically, too. California, for example, banned the sale of menthol cigarettes and flavored tobacco products. In 2017, the FDA announced a roadmap to ban menthol cigarettes nationally, as well as limit the amount of nicotine in cigarettes. Those plans caused Altria's stock price to plunge. Eliminating menthol and other flavors from cigarettes would really decrease their appeal to young people, and it would also address some of the problems in terms of equity in the cigarette market. So we know that the tobacco companies really did predatory marketing towards certain groups, particularly African Americans, Pacific Islanders, LGBT, and that those groups disproportionately smoke menthol cigarettes. Altria and its peers face other headwinds too. Widespread inflation has impacted volumes, driving some consumers away from premium brands like Marlboro Red toward lower priced cigarettes. And in addition to those headwinds, questions remain about how toxic devices like e-cigarettes and heat not burn products really are. E-cigarettes and heated tobacco products are still harmful. The tobacco companies are in a unique position where they were allowed to put these products on the market before there was really a full set of evidence about the harms. So they've basically made people in the world into guinea pigs for new products. While these products do have lower levels of some toxicants, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to cause less disease. We won't know for a long time what the net effect of these products are, but what we have seen is so far these products have brought literally millions of kids, kids who never would have smoked cigarettes, into the marketplace. For these kids, these products are certainly more dangerous than not smoking. More than 2.5 million middle and high school students use e-cigarettes in 2022, with the vast majority using flavored products. I think that what will happen is that there's going to be continued fragmentation in nicotine consumption, and people will use different products at different points in the day and they're going to be complementary. I think it's also important to keep in mind that we do have over 30 million smokers in the U.S., and we've had e-vapor products on the market for years at this point, and they haven't been successful in converting smokers. What you see is that, you know, the companies distract us with e-cigarettes and these new products that appear to be safer, but really they are very motivated to keep combustible cigarettes full of nicotine and menthol still on the market because that's where the money is.